Thank you, Pastor. All right. And so, and as uh, Pastor talked about, VBS is coming and it is quickly around the, the corner here. And, uh, and so there's been a lot of people that have been helping and working actively and trying to get things ready. And uh, you say, well, I'm just going to, I don't really have an interest in coming and, and working with the kids. Well, you know what? I, I tell you, for all the work that the uh, people have put into the skit, um, and so there are a lot of, we have a lot more adults this year in the VBS skit than we have in years past, and um, they have put a lot of effort into us. And so if you want to, just come and support them and encourage them. The purpose of the skit is we don't use it just as a, as a silly time or as a time to uh, try and tell uh, uh, a worldly story. We use that as an opportunity to give the gospel, and so we want to, the kids that are here to hear the gospel as much as possible. And so we work that heavily into our skit. Every night they're confronted with a different aspect of the gospel until finally it culminates in, in acceptance. And uh, and so if you want to come on out uh, Monday through Thursday night, I promise you, you will enjoy it. Um, the at least the adults that are acting in it, they all seem to think it's a it's an absolute gas. They think it's the funniest thing in the world. Um, and I don't know if, that, if they, that's really necessarily true or not, but they seem to enjoy some of the humor that's in it and some of the fun things that we get to do in the skit. And so, and they have put a lot, a lot of work. So uh, make sure that you come on out and uh, support them. And then on top of that, we have gentlemen already and ladies also that have been putting a ton of effort into uh, building a boat. We have a 20-foot boat right now in our, our bus barn. And so if you thought Noah was crazy for building a, an ark when there had never been rain, well, as you go out to our bus barn, we're building an ark, it seems. But it's not. It's our pirate ship. And uh, so we're getting that ready for our skit. And, uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to, God will miraculously be able to move that in here for us. <laughs> and so we're praying. I have the, I have the uh, entire youth ministry walk around it six times a day, every day, hoping that God will move it miraculously. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, and all, and all jesting aside, um, we are we it is built to move, and so we're planning on being able to get in here. We've engineered it purposely to be able to fit through our doors and get in up on here on stage a piece at a time, and then we'll put it back together. But uh, there's been a lot of effort already put into it, and uh, I think that you will enjoy uh, getting to come and, and part, if not participate and help out, at least you're getting to come and support those uh, that are and encourage them. Um, and so, because I know for us, it's always exciting to have other people be able to see uh, some of the effort or some of the things that you put a lot of effort into and uh, but uh, and if nothing else you come and get to see uh, Ben Cameron act crazier than usual and uh, of all things so it's a treasure island theme and of all the people to play the the character and most of you may be familiar with the character Long John Silver well we have a Long Jane Silver played by Mrs. Childers and she does a fanta uh, fantabulous fantastic she does a fantastic job. I, I'm sure you'll really enjoy it. Um, and again, like I said, the purpose of all this effort is not to get notoriety. It's not for us to have people pat us on the back. The purpose for this is to give the gospel. And uh, so please come on out, and uh, I'm sure it will be a blessing to you as much as it, we hope it will be to the kids that we're bringing in. If you have kids, you say, well, maybe I, and you say, I am way too old to have kids. You may not have kids in your house, but you probably know a few that you could invite. And, uh, and so we are doing a lot of things. Tell them, if nothing else, tell them if you come, you get a prize for being a visitor, and you get a prize for if you bring a visitor. And, uh, and so if nothing else, if you have to use the worldly incentives, get them here so they can hear the gospel. So, uh, but we really do want, it, want them here, and uh, we're sure that it will be a blessing to them if they come. And so tonight we're going to be looking at a, a subject that um, has been somewhat hitting me in the face for a few months now. Uh, so some from uh, teens in our, our teen group, some from just from exposure to uh, our society and different things that are going on. And uh, so it was one of those things that I was uh, and burned with as far as studying and trying to uh, develop myself to have a better understanding of this. I already had my own opinions formed on the subject, but to be honest, my opinion doesn't matter. And so, and if, if I preach my opinion from the pulpit, that is wrong. And, and so what I'm doing tonight is my best effort and based on the study that I've given to this subject. And so in the title of tonight's subject, it, or tonight's message is, Life is Worth Protecting. And so in Luke 22, verse 36, we see Christ make a very interesting statement to his disciples. And so I'll give you a few seconds as you turn there. 
to that portion of scripture. And uh, we had a team that had brought that up and asked, why, why this? Why was this brought up? And uh, why was he saying this? Almost, almost to the point where, it, not that Christ ever contradicted himself, but it was just something that stood out as being different from what had been heard in the past. And so in Luke 22, verse 36, we see this. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise uh, his script. And he that hath no sword, let him, let him sell his garment and buy one. And so I say, well, what is it that was so, so unique or so different for that, that team to hear or to see? And so one of the things that we see here that was unique about that is that Christ here had, has been a strong advocate for pacifism and so and for not for being nonviolent as much as possible. But now we see him encouraging his disciples if they don't have a weapon or if they don't have a sword to go out and buy one. Why would Christ do that? And, and so, and again, as a reminder, tonight's message, the title of it is Life is Worth Protecting. And so before we go any further, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll continue on. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity to be here tonight. God, I pray that uh, you would just give me the words to say, help me to uh, clearly express the, uh, your word. And so, Lord, and uh, just uh, help, every, or help the hearers tonight. God, I pray that we will accept your word and apply it to our lives. And we just pray things in Christ's name. Amen. And the first thing you understand and why life is prote- worth protecting is we need to first acknowledge who is the giver of life. And so to understand who is the giver of life, very plainly, I'll just state it for you. God is the giver of all life. And so God has given each individual your, the life that you have right now. If you are breathing, then God has given you that life. In Genesis 2, verse 7, it says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So before, at the very creation of man, God formed man from the ground, and he put life, he breathed the breath of life into Adam. Now, for the rest of us, we were not formed of the dirt, you know, my mother probably thought I was made out of dirt, considering how dirty I would come in in the evenings. But the, we were not necessarily formed from the dirt in our conception. In Isaiah 44, verse 20, uh, 24, it explains how the majority of us came to life in this world, how the Lord gave us life. And that is, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb... I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretches forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the, the earth by himself. The same way that God gave life to Adam in, bring, in breathing the breath of life into the, into the lifeless fo- or dust form, we see that God also gives life to us in the womb. If we were born, then God is the one that gave you life. But not only has God, not, so we see that God is the giver of life, but we also see that the purpose in life, and it was and still is, for man to glorify God. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that we do, regardless of of what that particular action is, regardless of, of how mundane it may seem to us, we should do everything that in our lives in a way that is pleasing to God. Every part of our life should be pleasing to God. But not only do we see that, it says, but we see that even though we are supposed to please God, even though that was the purpose that we were intended for, we see that Nat, or each of us understands the fact that we do not always do that. And it's true even with the first man, Adam, and that man chose to sin or rebel against God, and because of that, all men die. In Romans 5.12, it says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, speaking of Adam's sin against God, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We see that because of our sin, each of us rightly deserves to die. And we do die because of sin. And so both physically, but then also, if we've not accepted Christ as our Savior, spiritually. We also learn that from that, that God views human life so precious that he placed the punishment of our disobedience on Jesus Christ so that we could have eternal life. 
God values you so much that he was willing to send his son to die on the cross to pay for all the wrong things and all the disobedience, all the rebellion that we've, we have lived our lives towards in God. God still loved us enough that he sent his son to pay for your sins and mine. That's why it says in Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. What we rightly deserve for our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not only that, it says in 1 John 2, 2, it says, He and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That word propitiation means a payment that is made to an offended person to gain their approval, support, or liking instead of being punished in retribution for an offense or crime. I know it's kind of a long, long definition, but what it's talking about is that Jesus Christ, very plainly, he was punished for our sins. He was punished for all the wrong things that we, we, are, that we have done. And the purpose for that was so that we could now have a right standing with God. God valued your life, he valued my life so highly that he was willing to come down here himself and to be punished for our wrongdoing. That's why it also says in Romans 5 it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word commendeth means proved, showed, or demonstrated. So God proved and showed and demonstrated his love in that he allowed his son to die on the cross for you and me. That's how much God loves us. That's how, how, how valuable and how precious life is. If nothing else, you can look at your, if you, no matter how you feel about your life, no matter what value you may ascribe to yourself, you can at least know that you are valuable enough that the creator of all the universe thought that you were important enough to come down here to die on the cross to pay for all the wrongdoings that you did. That's how valuable you are. That's how precious you are in the eyes of God. That's how precious each of us should be to each other in the eyes of each other. Each and every person that is looking at me and every person that I am looking at is a precious soul that Jesus Christ died for. Every person in this entire world, even those that are, are reprobates and, and despicable people, those people are precious souls that Jesus Christ died for. We see that, God, that the value of man is not, a set, or is not set, or the value of life of a man, or the value of life of humans is not set by man. It's already been set by God. We are precious in the eyes of God. It is for this reason that as, or it is because of that, that in, as man became exceedingly more sinful, and that man, that eventually in history, man started to take the lives of other men. That we see that God then saw the need to, for a human government to police evil men. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 6, we see this. We see God speaking to Noah at this time. And so Noah has just come off the ark. God had to destroy uh, all but eight of uh, our eight human beings because of the thoughts of man were evil continuously, it says in the Bible. And because of that, when they got off the ark, God established the creation of human government. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, it says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. We are precious and we are fearfully, wonderfully made. And because of that, God, God established the fact that life needs to be protected. Not only that, it needs to be avenged if it is taken wrongly. And so those that take the life of another person unjustly deserve to have their life taken by human government. That's why in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, we see again that that statement and that thought is even elaborated on and reiterated. It says that government is here to, the purpose of government is to punish evildoers. And I'm not going to read through all of Romans 13, 1 through 4, but we see this in verse 1. It says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. That word ordained means uh, that God has officially granted them control or authority. And because of that, we are subject to our governments. 
to the point where that if we break the laws of our governments, the government rightly has the, if we break the laws of our government, and if, in particularly, if we kill someone else, we, our government has the right to end our lives. Because life, that life that we ended is precious enough to God that he has established a, an authority to punish those that do evil or who have taken life in a, in a wrong manner. And it says that it's for this reason. It says, For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to eth- execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That word of ve- a revenger carries, it implies that the government's role is to punish an offender for injuries or crimes committed against another person or group. Group. The punishment's severity is based on the type of crime and is only to be executed vengefully or after the fact. He says, what is, what is that talking about? One of, the things, one of the topics of discussion that has come up is the, that people should be monitored to ensure that they are not going to be threats. And it's always a dangerous statement. Not that we shouldn't monitor for threats, that we shouldn't look for threats. You should. You need to be aware of your surroundings. But in Scripture, government is never given the authority to presumptuously determine its citizens are going to do something wrong and thus disarm or restrict their civil liberties. History has shown us that governments that have done this are are concerned only about their own power, not about the security of its citizens, and are directly responsible, and this is based on historical fact, are directly responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of their own people in different countries around the world. So we see that there is a purpose for government. The purpose for government is to revenge those that have been wrong, particularly to revenge those, to revenge those that have, been, have wrongly had their lives taken by other human beings. But then also, this brings the question of are, up, at least in my mind, are Christians allowed to protect their own lives? Or are we simply just to wait until after our life has been taken and, and trust that the government will avenge or revenge our lives or revenge the taking of our life or our death. The first thing as a Christian that we should all, that our first pursuit should always be, our first pursuit as a Christian should always be to pursue a peaceful resolution if at all possible and violence as a defense is always the last resort. In Romans 12, verses 17 through 21, it says this, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Our, our priority as Christians is to seek peace and always to seek a peaceful resolution or some other version without I would say without compromising your convictions, without compromising your uh, faith and your, fa- and your obedience to God. But we should always seek a nonviolent solution if at all possible. And violence should always, as a defense, be a last resort. But what does, where does scripture stand on it? Where does God actually say about self-defense? Are we as Christians allowed to protect ourselves? We see in Exodus 22, we see now this is given as a law to the nation of Israel. And it was also a founding or a foundation upon which many of our laws as, a, as our nation in the United States are based upon. But in the Exodus 22 verses 2 and 3, we see that God gives an example of what is justifiable as a form of self-defense. And in Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3, it says this, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. And you say, okay, so what is that all talking about? That first implication there is that if there is a thief in Exodus 22 that is breaking into your home, 
and you are not aware of as far as you are as far as you understand you are reasonably fearing for your life and for those uh, for the lives of those in your house and you defend yourself and even possibly kill that thief then you are not at fault but if the sun is risen upon him in other words if you know if you see the thief you know that he is not a threat you know that he there is you do not have a reasonable fear that you are in danger or that others are in danger then you have a responsibility to not kill the thief and instead you're supposed to give him an opportunity to be captured and then also to provide restitution that is what God establishes here in Exodus in giving the laws to the nation of Israel and then it was based on those laws that we took and our forefathers developed our, and codified our laws for our nation. And so you, we see here that in instances that self-defense is allowable for the private citizen and protection of life particularly. Protection of your life and protection of the life of those in your household. In Psalms 144.1, we see even that God even teaches, or God is even an author and teaches us to self-defense. He says, and blessed be the Lord, uh, Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. It is God, according to that passage of scripture, that helps us to fight and to even to defend ourselves. And again, I would reiterate the fact that defense, or particularly violence as a defense, is always a last resort. And so based on Romans 12 and verse 17 and 18, if it be possible, as much life in you, live peaceably with all men. We also see that there are a number of examples of times in the Bible where God allowed people, individuals, and are individual citizens to protect their lives and others. And in particular, we look here at Abraham in Genesis 14. I'm not going to go through. I'm not going to read through it just for sake of time. I know that we're we're getting close to our end here. And it says in Genesis 14, verse 4, or in, in chapter 14, verse 14, we see Abraham found out that his nephew Lot was in danger. He armed his servants and that are that had combative training in order to rescue his nephew Lot. That many of the people and, and many of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah from a confederation of evil kings that took them captive. And we see that God gave them a great victory. And it's even from that later that we learn about giving a tithe. Then also we see in Nehemiah 4, verse 16 and 17, again, we see this time Nehemiah, who has been sent back by the king of Persia, back to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. And he is being attacked by other groups that are all around the children of Israel in that area. And we see that he's in being attacked, we see that in order to protect his servants that were rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, Nehemiah organized half the citizen workforce into security attachments to protect each other, or protect each other with one half working and one half um, defending. Even then, every laborer that worked on the wall was also expected to be armed for self-defense and the defense of others. In Esther 8.11, we see again, where this time, a man, evil man named Haman tricks the, the king of Persia into signing into law the eradication of the Jewish people. And once again, we see that because the order of the king of Persia was not able to be rescinded or it could not be, be taken back, we see that instead another law is passed, this law allowing the individual citizens uh, or Jewish citizens within the, or the, the empire of Persia to defend themselves. It says, in order to prevent the slaughter of the Jewish people, God working through the king of Persia as well as Queen Esther and her cousin Mordecai, uh, they, we see that one, their response was not to call the Persian army or police force to defend the Jewish Jewish citizens within that country. Instead, we see that they were allowed, the Jews were allowed to defend themselves and their family against those that would harm them. And even to this very day, the Jewish people still celebrate the victory that God gave them over their, over their attackers during the Feast of Purim. Amen. 
And so it's still celebrated to this very day, a recognition that God allowed the, the citizens, again, these were not, these, the Jews did not form an army. They did band together, but they did not form an army. They simply just came together in civil groups in order to defend themselves. Then also we see this in Luke 22. We saw earlier where Christ commands his disciples to arm themselves for, for protection. Again, the arming was not to, Christ is not developing a, a, a worldly army for us to try and conquer worlds, much like the Muslims do, and seeking to force people into their religion. That is not what's being endorsed here. But what is being endorsed is a, is a self-defense. And evidently, Peter seemed to understand this, although he took it a little too far and took it out of context, because in John 18, we see that Peter, after Christ has just told him, hey, if you... If you don't have a sword, go get one. Peter and, and several other disciples says, hey, we got two swords here right now. Christ says, and that's good. That's enough. This is paraphrasing. And so, but then, when it came time for Christ to be arrested, it, Christ had to be arrested. Christ had to be taken by the Jewish people. Christ had to be, um, had to be executed, or I'm sorry, Christ had to be murdered on the cross in order to pay for my sin, your sins and my sins. And because of that, Christ was willingly going to the cross at this point. But Peter not understanding this after just being told, hey, listen, take a sword and defend yourself. We see Peter, when they come to take Christ, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his, his right ear. Now the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath, into the sheath the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band of, and the captain of the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. The admonition in John 18 was not to sheath the weapon, and it was not, an, to, it was not a command to abandon or relinquish the weapon. It was, not to, it was not a renunciation of defense, merely a statement that it was not the time for it. Christ knew that he had to fulfill his purpose. We see, what is all of this? What does all this bring us to as a conclusion? Ultimately, the conclusion is this. As Christians, we need to value life. We need to see that it is, a, it is worth defending. And now I'm not advocating that everybody here should take up... Take up or to take a proactive stance in trying to uh, defend or, or protect physically individuals lives. I'm not trying to say that. Regardless of our opinion on how we may think other or think of how others may view us, I hope we can all agree that life is a precious gift from God and it is worth defending. And if you choose not to defend it, just that you would simply acknowledge that if someone else does, they are not sinning. Defending life is not a sin. Protecting those that you love, protecting yourself from serious bodily harm or even death is not a sin. These days, more and more people are trying to convince, and they're trying especially to convince our young people, the next generation of voters, that self-defense is wrong. They try and teach that those that commit crimes are the ones that are the ones that should be pitied, not those that are trying to protect themselves or those that are the victims of crimes. And the truth is, is that as Christians, we need to stand up and say, no, it is not wrong for a person that is innocent to defend themselves. It is not wrong for a person to protect their loved ones from, from death or serious bodily harm. Life is a precious gift that is worth protecting. Life is so, so, so precious that God was willing to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to, set, to sacrifice his own life for ours. The question is this, is how precious is your life to you? How precious is the life of those around you to you? Are those that are unsaved, have you been willing to try and tell them about Jesus Christ so that their life, their precious life, might be saved from eternity, separated from God in the lake of fire? Are you willing to, to tell others that life is precious? From the womb all the way to the grave, life is a precious gift. 
Maybe you sit here today and you have not accepted the most precious gift that anyone can accept, and that's knowing that you're going to go to heaven, that you can have eternal life. If you haven't accepted the life that God has offered each and every one of us, that, God, that Christ was willing to sacrifice himself for the entire world so that we could all have it if we, want, if we accept it. If you've never accepted that, don't leave here today without talking to someone. Talk to Pastor Fisher. Talk to me. Talk to any one of the deacons or our wives. And someone will be happy to show you from the Bible how you can know for certain that when you die that you're going to go to heaven. We had two little girls today that came forward and said that they, they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior with their, with their grandma just a few days ago. Amen. Life is precious. And I'm not saying that you have to go around, that you have to defend it or that you have to do anything. But don't attack those that do value life enough to stand up for it. And if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I hope that you'll make that decision tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as the musician gets ready to come forward for our invitation, not really a, a strong invitation for making a, a decision necessarily in your life, but one that does have impacts or does impact our country. Are you relinquishing a right that God has given us, a right that even God expects us to utilize at times to those that would, would take it from us for their own purposes, not for our benefit, not for the benefit of anyone else, but for themselves so they can have more power? Or maybe it's just something that you haven't valued the life of those that are around you the way that you should. Maybe you haven't seen the person that is undesirable, foul-tempered, bad-smelling, that someone that is someone that is just, you have no real personal desire to be, spend time with, but that's still a valuable soul that Jesus Christ died for. And that if you have the opportunity to share the gospel with, you should at least give them a track. Whatever the issue is that God is dealing with you tonight, as the instruments play, as pastor comes now for the invitation, if there's some area in your life that the Spirit has impacted you, then I hope that you'll make that decision tonight. Thank you.